After dominating the rap scene in 1985 with his critically and commercially acclaimed album, Radio, LL looked to further push the envelope by creating what is now known as one of the greatest hip-hop albums of all time, Bigger and Deffer. This is Bigger and Deffer 35, a video series honoring the 35th anniversary since its release on May 29th, 1987. If Radio made him a superstar, then Bigger and Deffer made LL Cool J a household name. At the height of his career, Bigger and Deffer carried him into rap superstardom, going triple platinum and becoming one of the most successful hip-hop albums to that point. LL presented himself as a 19-year-old who was living the dream. He was a rapper with movie star good looks and a passion for rhyming who was able to lyrically bang with the best of them. It was an album that appealed to everyone. He was bigger and deafer, bad, and he knew it. And he wasn't shy about letting you know just how bad he was. You know, the first album did well, and the second album did well. That's how you account for it. But as far as, you know, I just work hard. You know, I put my heart into my music and I make it everything I can make it. Well, I talk about Cops, people can't stop me, neither can the police, you know what I mean? That's like, in radio, I can't look down my radio on my first album. That's an attitude where you grow up believing that the police are enemies, you know what I mean? It's just everything around you, the subway, I give, Dougie Fresh said, I give you a token, you know what I mean? It all, it definitely is a big influence. It, in the city, it's, you know what I mean? That's the whole thing about it, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's really nothing I can really explain about it, it's just, it's the way it is. That's the heart of rap, that competition in the streets and all that, but you know, this is what it is now. This is what I'm doing with it. I put out what I, what I feel is good in my heart. You know what I'm saying? And the public knows what's good and they'll like it. Well, it originates from a culture and a, and a place where, you know, you have to brag to protect yourself. It's just like a cat expanding itself so that the other cats don't mess with it. At the time, Def Jam Recording co-founders Rick Rubin and Russell Simmons were going their separate ways. Ruben, who had produced LL Cool J's radio album and the Beastie Boys' License to Ill, was no longer interested in working with Def Jam X. Simmons, though, wanted LL to work on his second full-length project. Fortunately, Simmons had a solution. The album's production was handled by the LA Posse. Here, they mostly used sample-based production. However, they also utilized drum machines to put together some of the standout tracks on the album. DJ Bobcat comments on his process with Bigger Endeavor. I flew out to New York as part of the LA Posse to work with Death Jam artist named Breeze. Breeze was supposed to be the up-and-coming LL, so Russell Simmons signed him. So we were working with Breeze and doing such a great job that Russell asked us if we were interested in doing pre-production on LL's next album. We said yes and started working on records with LL. Daryl Pierce comments, It was epic because it was LL. It was a trip, man, because he was LL. He was already in our minds a superstar. We had butterflies and everything. We were free to make whatever we wanted to make and that's what we made. That's what we came out when we when we went to the studio with LL. We had no plan. We were just going to go in and make music. Out of that came "I'm Bad," "I Need Love," you know, all those you know joints. And it was just a matter of just us making what we felt like making. Nobody told us that. We just went in and did what we felt like making. After commuting between New York and Los Angeles. L.A. Posse eventually moved to New York, initially spending time in L.L.'s hometown of Queens before settling in Brooklyn as they worked on what would become Bigger and Deffer. The differences between L.L. Cool J and the L.A. Posse proved instrumental in the album's evolution. We were West Coast dudes, L.A. dudes, Pierce says. We had a whole different vernacular. New York was a hip-hop culture. In L.A., we had a gang culture. There was no hip-hop culture in L.A. So when we're getting to know each other and we're talking about where we're from, a lot of our conversations were telling and teaching him about the gang culture in L.A. In addition to cultural differences, there were musical ones. Like Ruben, Muffla was a proficient at the Roland 808 drum machine. The type of guy who, if you hummed him a beat, he could program it. Bobcat had a different style of scratching than LL's DJ Cut Creator. Then there was DJ Pooh, who later wrote Friday with Ice Cube. Pooh was a lot of fun to work with, man, LL Cool J says. He's creative and funny as hell. 
He's one of the funniest dudes on the planet, man. The dude is hilarious. With his team intact, LL Cool J was finally ready to make bigger and deeper with the hopes of breaking barriers. With LL Cool J's production team finally intact for Bigger and Duffer, they begin a six-month journey at the Chung King House of Metal in New York City. The recording started in December 1986 and concluded in the early summer of 1987. Bigger and Duffer begins with I'm Bad, the album's first single. LL tears into his competition with amazing precision and makes dozens of sharp boasts. The beat, which samples the Rhythm Heritage's theme from SWAT, is a hyperkinetically charged piece of work. The album has its fair share of lyrical exhibitions such as Get Down and Point Three Five Seven Break It On Down. On the warp speed, ah, let's get ill, LL exhibits his skill at using alliteration in his rhymes as he unleashes five brief verses. Go Creator Go is LL's rock-infused tribute to his DJ, J. Brian Cut Creator Phil Pot. The track incorporates elements of Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good and Roll Over Beethoven, as well as Bill Haley and his Comets Rock Around the Clock. LL's performance of the song on Saturday Night Live in 1987 is considered by some to be the best rap performance ever on the long-standing variety show and one of the best televised hip-hop performances of all time. He then dedicates a song to the Bristol Hotel. The Bristol Hotel is a real hotel. I asked him, I was like, is the Bristol Hotel a real song? He was like, yeah, him and E-Love were laughing because that's where they would go and take care of some business occasionally. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Room 515. <laughs> But perhaps the best known song on Bigger and Deffer is I Need Love, one of the first real hip hop ballads. The song was a huge success and one of the first rap crossover hits in hip hop. With this record, LL became an instant household name in America. The song was supported on every major radio station in the 1980s and elevated LL into a household name internationally. Bigger and Deffer does end strong with The Doo Wop one of LL's most versatile records. The song is built around a sample of the opening seconds of The Moon Glows' Over and Over Again. With the release set for May 29th, LL Cool J looked to have another radio era success but LL Cool J wasn't ready for his world domination with Bigger and Duffer. During the month of Bigger and Duffer's release, the album reportedly shipped 430,000 units within two weeks. However, during press time, the figure had increased to more than a whopping 650,000 units, according to Def Jam Vice President Bill Stephanie, who quotes, LL was strong with his first album, Radio, which came out in November 1985. That sold over 800,000 copies, making it one of the highest debuts ever, so we knew he'd have a strong reaction to this one. 
The album debuted at number 52 on the Billboard 200 and leaped to number 13 in its second week, which became the fastest breaking rap album at the time. To compare that with LL Cool J's contemporary at the time, it took Run DMC's Raising Hell four weeks to crack the top 20 in 1986, and Beastie Boys licensed it out eight weeks to crack the top 20 in January 1987. By the fourth week, LL Cool J's Bad Album had reached number one on the Billboard R&B slash hip-hop charts, replacing Whitney Houston's Whitney Album. That same week on July 11, 1987, the album reached the top 10 on the Billboard 200 at number 8. With this defeat, LL Cool J placed his first ever number 1 R&B slash hip-hop album and his first top 10 Billboard 200 album. By August 29, 1987, LL Cool J's Bad Album had remained at number 1 for 8 weeks on the R&B slash hip-hop charts while it reached its peak on the Billboard 200 at number 3. By the end of October 1987, LL Cool J's Bad Album remained at number 1 for a total of 11 non-consecutive weeks on the charts. By the end of the Bigger and Deeper era, it remained on the Billboard 200 charts for 53 weeks and 47 weeks on the R&B slash hip hop charts. To those fools sitting in stands over there and they were guessing about how many copies. This is a thing called a double platinum album. How yep. many does that mean? Two million. Two million copies of this. And going up. Ah. 